Leon Matau, uh, formerly of uh, Microsoft and now at Facebook. Yeah, we'll thank talk. you very much. Uh, yes. So, yes, this work was carried out when I was in Microsoft in collaboration with a lot of people. And I thank uh, the organizer for giving me a chance to tell about it. And uh, so I said with the collaboration with a lot of people and as a pure observation, uh, Jonas here has been on this screen at least three times already. <laughs> so is there a cause? We will see. <laughs> um, so here is um, a metaphor of uh, what we're doing here. We have big data. We have data scientists looking at big data, finding bits of knowledge for anyone to use. And of course, the topic is that we know that this person here needs to sort correlation from causation, either using experiments that are costly or using instrumental assumptions or whatever. And what's going to happen is that you newly empowered anyone is going to make decision and change the world, and this loop is a bit worrying. Um, so I'm going to talk about a case study. And around 2010, I found myself working in the ad center in Microsoft. And my motivation to go there was because I'm a past in machine learning, quite TV past, and I wanted to see what machine learning does to people. And I have nothing to brag about. It's absolutely very bad. It makes the life of engineers miserable. And I'm going to try to explain why and explain how we can try to solve this. So internet services collect a lot of data, and you have thousands of people working on the service. A significant fraction of them are using uh, all kinds of statistical methods or machine learning algorithms to work with data, and design decisions are made by development teams. So if you take the case of a search engine, which is a simple case, you have users send query to the search engine, the search engine displays results, everything is logged, and learning algorithms and people are trying to find smart changes to make on the search engine. And uh, interestingly, learning algorithm people are no different there. They have the same information, and they do the same kind of actions. So it's not a machine learning problem. It's just a learning problem. And typically, there is an A-B testing gateway here, which is a kind of uh, uh, randomized control trial. If you want to do something, you're going to test it on a small fraction of users, see how it works, compare it to control, and if it's good, you're going to do it. And Ron Kohavi has a very nice paper about A-B testing in this setup. And in many talks, he says that when you, uh, sorry, when you come here, about one third of the proposed changes are just bad. One third are good, and one third do, no, do nothing. So I don't know if he means the three thirds to be equal. But if they are close to equal, it means that something's really wrong happening here because people here don't find a large proportion of good changes to do to the system. Now, if you do something like ad placement, it's a bit more complicated. You have a lot more feedback loops because you have an extra ad there, the advertisers. So users and queries, advertisers have ads and bids, and you show ads, you find prices, ads determine what users can click, whether they click or not, they experience consequences and might change their behavior. When all these behaviors change, advertisers have different returns of interest, they might change their bits. And all this is logged and all this is going to change, all the data you're going to log is going to change in response to what you do, so what machines and people are going to see is going to be different. Of course you can do A-B testing, but suppose you try, for instance, you think that you don't want to show ads on orange juice. So you're going to take 1% of the users and slash the ads on orange juice. You see something. Now, advertisers about orange juice are not going to see anything. Just 1% of the users see a little bit less. But if you generalize this to 100% of the users, advertisers are going to see it and then say, hey, there is no point uh, putting so much money on orange juice. Let's slash these ads and put money elsewhere. And things are going to change. So the A-B testing that people do in ad is not principled. They do it because this is what they can do. So now if you look at what are the conceptual tools for engineers, you can do auction theory. This addresses the feedback loop with the advertisers and the bidding and things under severe simplifying assumptions. And there is a lot of work to make the assumptions less severe, but it becomes very complex. You have things like bandits and contextual bandit theory, which exists in machine learning. This addresses the learning feedback loop, what's happening because you change the data that uh, humans and machines are going to see to change the system. 
It's also under severe simplifying assumptions. And the problem is that we have no systematic way to take the whole problem with all its feedback loops and reduce it to a combination of simple problems that are amenable to theory. So it's a bit annoying. So what it is that an engineer wants to do? They like calculus. They want to measure things on a system and think about changes they could do and calculate and simulate and try to figure out what this is going to do. And if they find something good, they're going to do it. And they hope that the calculus is going to be a good predictor. What we see in these systems is that this doesn't work. Uh, they motivate new design with correlations observed in the logs, extrapolate such correlations to model a new design, and they often predict incorrectly the direction, actually 50% of the cases, and the quantitative prediction is completely wrong. And the reason is that they use the wrong calculus. They use the calculus of probabilities. They use Bayes' rule. They use standard kind of confidence intervals based on central limit, while they should use a calculus that's connected to causation. So my goal was to provide a set of tools. And these tools are, of course, based on the work of many people on causal inference. And this is, in a sense, the empirical side of uh, Judea Spell talk, where he says, I want an algebra, I want a calculus for causation. I want a set of tools for engineers that includes replacing base rule by something else, and that includes uh, having means to get good confidence intervals and understand what they mean, that includes means to estimate the linear response and uh, handle the feedback loops properly, and I'm going to, that's my summary, this is what I want to talk about. And it also has to be simple. So let me start by counterfactual expectation just to set the language. So my background, I was educated with mathematics and physics and not computer science. So graphs do nothing for me. I just put them on the slide because they're nice pictures. But uh, for me, I, as this is, these things are happening here. And I, I, okay, that's, I have plenty of friends who can look at the graph like this and see plenty of things. I can't, I have to write it. So, uh, here is the little model I'm going to use as an example. You start with user intent and add inventory, which are two exogenous variables. I don't say where they come from. And I assume there is a function, I don't know what it is, that depends on the user intent and some noise variable that gives me a query. And then there are functions that use, let's say, the query and the add inventory to give ads, but that's part of my code, that's part of my program. I know that function perfectly well. And it could have also a random throw of the dice in there and I can find the bits that correspond to the ads, and I can compute scores that's going to score the ads against the query, but not using the bits. Then I can use some kind of system that's going to decide what I'm going to show to the user, and I use the term slate for that, which is a kind of jargon that's convenient. And I can also use the scores and the bits to determine prices. And then there is another function I don't know here that's going to take the user instant and the slate, give the clicks, and if I know the clicks, I can have an idea of how the prices are going to be applied and have an idea of revenue. So that's my model. And an intervention is a change of something in there. Any algebraic change you want doesn't have to be fixing a value. You can sh replace a function by another one as long as it remains uh, without loops, I'm okay. Now, the question is what to do with all these functions we don't know. And the idea is to replace knowledge by statistics. And to do this, you need some kind of isolated experiments at the first level. Of course, you can do some things that are more refined, do, but, but at the first, at the degree zero, you need isolated experiments. So you need to isolate your things. So in a system like this, you're going to say, for instance, that user intent and adventory comes from a probability distribution that I don't know, but constant. It's not true. They're going to be a feedback loop, but I'm going to assume that to start. That's an isolation assumption. And here, if I have this, I have P of U and V, I can take my uh, uh, model here, interpret all these Fs are conditional distributions, and I get a big factorization of the probability of everything. So omega is everything for me. Uh, and that's a Bayes network, which is uh, something popularized by Judy Appel uh, 10 years or maybe 20 years before the causation. And there are a lot of technologies to work with it. And I use little circles for this one instead of little squares. Uh, if I intervene on the system, I'm basically changing a factor in that distribution, or a couple of factors. So what I have now is not one base net, but plenty of base net that share certain factors and have certain factors different. 
whenever I have an experiment, I have a different base net, and certain factors are shared and others are not shared on the basis of things I believe about my system. And I use the notation, I use a star here to represent under intervention. That's the way I distinguish under intervention from normal. And uh, it's, um, it's pretty simple because uh, usually the intervention is complex. So my problem is to answer a counterfactual question of the following kind. What performance metrics would have we observed if, when the data was collected, we had used our placement algorithm M prime instead of M without incurring advertiser, user, or learning feedback effects to start with? I'm going to put the feedback effects in the system later on. Uh, this is a strange question. That did not happen, could not have happened. At best, you could say, uh, because there's a, a time lag between the feedback loops, that maybe this tells you what's going to happen immediately after doing your intervention. But a couple of weeks later, it's going to be different. And uh, I know there is this question that has been uh, raised several times here about whether we should consider counterfactuals that could not happen. And I'm going to give you a physical example. Suppose I have an electrical device. It's customary in engineering to analyze an electrical device by seeing how it responds to an impulse response, an, an impulse signal. You cannot do that. If you sell a, send an impulse signal into your electrical device, you're going to burn it. So this is a counterfactual that doesn't make sense. But still, it's well defined, you can reason with it, and you can make predictions that are going to be useful. And I'm going to try to do that. I'm starting with this counterfactual that has very limited value, and I will try to, to have a calculus that allows me to do things with it. So we can measure this by simply important sampling methods. So I'm going to skip the simple stuff and say, I have my P star under intervention. I want to do something different here. And I want an expectation of something. The normal one, the one I measure, is the expectation of L under the observational distribution. And I want a Y star, which is the expectation of L under P star. I just insert a ratio, interpret this as an expectation over P, which is what I have, and just sample it. That's the basis of important sampling. And this is what's behind most of the things. Now, of course, I need to be able to compute these ratios. So if I write these ratios, remember they have plenty of factors in common. In particular, Things I don't know are very often common factors. When they're not common factors, you have to be smarter. That means that it reduces to, in the numerator, the factors in P star, not in P. In the denominator, factors in P, not in P star. So as long as my intervention is in my code, I know these things. I can compute that. Now, of course, uh, you have a problem of confidence. These ratios can be large. So the idea of this ratio is to say that if in your experimental data, you might have, by pure chance, a situation that corresponds to something that's of interest to you. You're going to overweight that. And conversely, you have things that don't correspond to things that are of interest to you. You're going to underweight that. Now, if the two distributions, oh, sorry, if the two distributions overlap, you're fine. The ratios are going to be reasonable. If they don't overlap, either you're going to multiply by zero, or you're going to wait for the rare events the few rare events in which the coefficient, the weighting coefficient will be extremely large. And it's bad for confidence intervals. So the way you deal with this is by biasing your system. So basically, you're going to ignore the few samples that might dominate your, your estimate, and you're going to try to bound the effect using simple, bound, simple bounding techniques. So I'm going to skip on the math. Uh, what it means is that your confidence interval has two parts. One part measures the statistical aspect. If this part is too large, it means you need to sample more. And another part measures the uh, exploration aspect. If this part is too small, it means you don't have enough overlap, and you need to redesign your experiment with more randomization so that you can actually explore the situation of interest. And I'm going to give an example of this. So my example is going to be extremely simple. So if you look at the search engine, in that case the Bing, uh, because it's the one I worked on, you have ads here, and they, they receive a lot more clicks, but they're more annoying. And ads on the side that nobody clicks on, almost. And the difference is just a threshold on the score. And I'm just going to reason about this threshold. So what I'm going to do is have uh, three simultaneous uh, subsets of the population. The first receives 
uh, treatment where the score like this have been randomized by a log normal multiplier. So basically 95% of the time is between half and twice the no nominal one. And I have two controls, one without randomization and one where the randomization is the same but the, the, the center has been shifted by 18%. And I get this kind of, uh, okay, that's the, again this kind of curves. So the center point here is uh, the, the, the measurement point. Is, this is where I am when I'm running my experiment on the first um, thing. And the blue things are the predictions if I change my threshold by, values, by, by some values. The solid blue is the inner interval, is the one that describes exploration. It means that when it, it becomes large, when I'm too far from my initial conditions and the randomization I have in my data is not enough to inform me about what's happening here. And the little space here is the, statistic, the statistical one. And if you think about it, this is very different from a confidence interval in statistics. In statistics, when you have a confidence interval, you think asymptotic normality. This is not asymptotically normal. In the blue, I have no idea what's going on. Then, so basically, instead of being like a bell shape, it's something that goes up, that's flat, and goes down. So, well, main line with the, this is the number, average number of main lines per page. This is the clicks. And if you look at something like the revenue, you see that you have a much bigger statistical uh, deviation. And that's because a small number of ads bring a big fraction of the revenue. And therefore, if you look in terms of revenue, you're emphasizing a small subset of the data, so you have less statistical resolution, but the exploration part is still the same in terms of percentage. So it's nice to separate the confidence intervals in this way. Now, if you do something like this compared to A-B testing, when you do A-B testing, you have one bit of information. Is treatment better of control? If you do something like this, you collect data that's randomized, you can do plenty of things a posteriori. You could change the, uh, the reserves, the threshold prices, the, the threshold in a way that depends on the query. The same data can answer. And the more you use smartly randomized data, the more things you can say without doing any A-B testing whatsoever. And it's rigorous and you know exactly, you have exact confidence intervals that tell you whether you can trust it or not. Now, we would like to make these things better. So we need ways to use knowledge or to improve the confidence intervals. And I'm going to describe two ways, and uh, they are very simple, and they do different things. The first one works on the exploration part of the confidence interval. And I don't know that it's been published before our paper, but I'm probably wrong because I don't know this literature perfectly. And the second one is using predictor function, which is a variant of double robust. And this has been published in many places, in particular on the work of James Robbins. So displacing the weights, okay, that's uh, very abstract. I'm going to make it simpler. Sometimes you randomize things at the level of the scores and use these scores to show something to the user. But many sets of scores could have led to the same image shown to the user. And because the user doesn't see the scores, you know that they would have, have the same outcome. So whenever you see something with a particular, out, a particular page that you show, you know that this could, be, uh, this could explain what you did with the scores you actually used, but all the scores that could have been used to produce that same image. So the way you do it is by uh, essentially displacing the weighting. You're going basically to integrate away the score from the probabilities, and the ratio is going to become uh, uh, two integrals that are a bit painful to compute. Uh, well, I'm going to, the derivations are in the paper, but basically when you do this, you do that. And here is an example. This is the curve we had before, and if I just do this on this simple stuff of estimating a single threshold, this is the curve I get. So you see there is not much change on the statistical part of the interval, but there is a big change on the exploration side of the interval. Uh, there is something I didn't say, by the way, when I'm showing you this curve, and uh, I realize I, I should have. So blue is the prediction. Yellow is the control flight that was 18% lower. So it's predicts correctly. I just forgot to say that. And red is the one without randomization. You don't lose much by randomizing. Okay. And by doing this here, I think I had something like a f four or five decimals in my uh, the accuracy of my prediction. So it's accurate. I get a, I get a result that's predictive. It satisfies the engineering criterion. I do something, I make a prediction, 
I've tried it and prediction works. So the second method is connected to variance reduction. Here I'm showing daily effects, and red and gray are two variants of the system. And you see that a lot of variance comes just from the daily effect that people don't click at night and they click during the day, and very little from the red and gray. And of course, you would like to use only the little variance instead of the big one. So the way you do it is by inventing a predictor function. So I can build any function I want. In fact, I could use machine learning to do that on observational data. That wouldn't change anything provided I'm not using this particular datum. So this function is fixed here. And I'm going to say that the Y star is made by computing what's happening to the, the predictor under intervention, which I know completely because it's my predictor, it's my function, it's my code. And the difference between YI and the predictor, and this one I used to need to use the weighting. And the problems I have in computer intervals are because these weights are sometimes large. But if my predictor is any good, this has a much smaller variance and much smaller moments. Therefore, by doing this, I get a much better confidence interval. And that's going to be used in many respects. And that's a variant of the doubly robust approach. And this is something that uh, I've seen in various forms in various of the talks here. Now I'm going to talk about something a bit different that comes from my, uh, my background in math and physics, which is linear response. And the mathematical motivation is the following. If you consider interventions, you can do a system like this. They form a group. You can make no intervention. This is the natural element. If you define the combined intervention A and B and do intervention C, it's the same as doing A and then B, C together. That's trivial. You can undo an intervention. There is an inverse. They form a group. And if I can define small interventions in any sense, I can make lead derivatives and have a whole world of techniques I can use. Now, lead derivatives, derivatives are going to change complicated things in, the, in my uh, linear, linear space into linear operations in the differential space. Oh, I need to make this less abstract. So first of all, suppose I want to know whether scoring model M1 is better than M2. What I can do is compute the click-through rate if you had used model M1, minus the click-through rate if you have used model M2, that's the ATE, essentially. And I can improve the confidence interval via predictor functions, of course. Fine. Now I'm going to, let's say, parameterize the scoring model by some parameter theta that's a vector, or just a number if you want to. And so that way I have a notion of small perturbation. And if I want the derivative of, let's say, my click-through rate with respect to theta, I can make the same thing with plus d theta and theta divided by d theta. That's related to the policy gradient algorithm in uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, well, I can just run the derivation, and I found an expression which is basically a weighted average, as usual, except that the weights can be negative. And my weights can still be large because I have a nasty ratio here. But the good point is that if the p of omega, which is the one I use to collect the data, is the same as p theta omega, which is the one on which I want the derivative, this, this one goes away. And I get good estimates. So that means that it's quite hard to give a counterfactual estimate a little bit far away from where you are, but it's quite easy to get a derivative. And of course, you can use the same technologies to get confidence intervals on these things. Now, if you have derivatives, you can do hill, climb, hill, hill climbing, you can do optimization. So here is an example. Uh, in a paper by uh, Sebastian Lai and uh, Preston McAfee, ads were ranked by uh, taking the product of the bit times the probability of click to the power alpha. And the idea is that if you cannot estimate the probability of click well, you want to have an alpha that's less than one because maybe the advertiser know bet knows better and the bit contains the information. It's quite a nice idea. And of course, you can group the queries by clusters and use different alpha car and reserve, uh, so the thresholds, because you're going to change the rate of the scores. And uh, if you know how to compute derivatives and counterfactual estimates, you can get a graph like this. So the red level lines tell you the variation of the average number of mainline ads. The black one are an estimation of the advertiser value but I'm not going to go on details. And of course, you can decide to move to a point that's optimal, and you can do that in every query clusters, and you can do plenty of tuning optimization of your system that way by just hill climbing because you have derivatives and values. 
Now, if I'm doing this, I'm doing now what this guy is supposed to do, this person is supposed to do. I'm taking the logs and I'm trying to find how to adjust my model parameters. But it's not part of my system. I've externalized the loop. What I've done is I said the model parameter is not a variable of my system, it's a parameter. I'm going to say how I'm optimizing it somehow. Because I assume a policy for and a behavior for that person. I say this, this person is rational, they should do hill climbing in this parameter space. And I have other feedback loops. I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to externalize them. Uh, what's going to help me is the lead derivative again, because when I'm externalizing feedback loops, it would be very complicated to do in the actual space of the functions, but in the, in the differential space, everything turns into linear operations, so it's going to be sort of nice. So here is an example. If we increase an ad relevance threshold, we show less ads, we lose revenue in the short time. Users see more relevant ads, are more likely to click on ads in the future, possibly making up for the lost revenue. But advertisers will add that their bids could go both ways because they receive less clicks from more engaged users. So even a priori, I'm not able to answer what's going to be the outcome of this question. This question. And the counterfactual question is something like this. How would the system performance metrics have changed if we had applied a small change of the parameter theta of the ad placement system long enough before the data collection period to have reached an equilibrium during the collection period? It seems a bit convoluted, but I'm going to try to do that. To do that, I'm going to externalize. I'm going to say, well, the bits of the advertiser, the parameters in that bit uh, box here, and uh, following actually a, a, a way to formulate the problem that comes from uh, Suzanne and uh, Denis Nikipilov, I'm going to say that advertisers see their clicks and how much they pay. But they don't see all the system. So they have a limited information. Now, I'm also going to follow the economic uh, literature by assuming that the tether is rational. They're not rational in real life, but you could make experiments for that. So if my advertisers observe a certain number of clicks and a certain uh, amount he pays, uh, but first of all, he could do the same thing. He could randomize his bid a little bit to estimate the response of the system. So he's going to construct a curve like this, assuming he's rational and quite smart, that shows how changing the bids change the number of clicks he received during a certain period of time and the amount he pays. If you assume the advertiser has a value per click, which is a big assumption again, uh, you, he would like to be at the point where the difference is maximum. So basically, he keeps most of the value for himself, which means that the derivative of this curve has to be equal to the value. Now, you can reason about value and all these things, but you can say this in a simpler way. If you observe that an advertiser chooses to be on this curve at a certain derivative, the bet is that if you change something in the system, he will try to find a bid that leads him to have the same derivative. And that's a differential statement. So I'm just going to encode this differential statement. So, uh, so basically, I can try to do the same thing, estimate the, the derivative he wants using the same kind of methods. So I cannot randomize the bits because I don't control the bits, but I can randomize the scores and interpret this as a randomization of the bits. So it's a bit of cooking and a bit of calculus. And I can make this kind of ratios. And ratios are complicated. You have to be careful about confusion intervals. You have to realize that there are limitations, like some advertisers are not in the system because they think it's too expensive. If you make it less expensive, they might enter, but you have no signal for that, so you get a partial signal. But once you have this, you can just write the differential expression that says that they want to remain at a position in the curve with the same derivative. That's a differential equation. And that's my equilibrium condition. And if you solve this linear system, in the differential space, everything is linear, what you get is what is the variation of the bit when you vary your theta. So if I vary my theta in my uh, uh, scoring system, eventually, after feedback, they're going to vary the bit by a small amount. I cannot do that very far. I could do that in the differential space. But that's enough to compute the total effect of the thing. If I vary my theta a little bit and account for the variations of the bits, here is the variation of my click rate, for instance. Now, if I have more feedback loop, I can do the same thing. I can write the total derivative. I can solve the linear system formed by all the equilibrium conditions. And I get the answer to my same question. So did I go too fast? I don't know. Anyway, conclusion. 
I promise the following. Means to measure confidence expectation with meaningful confidence intervals. Uh, means to introduce knowledge to improve the confidence intervals. Means to estimate the linear response and add the feedback loops in the system. So it seems very nice, but look at this. This is the real world, and this happens also in uh, companies. Big data is here, people are doing things here, and my newly empowered engineer makes independent decisions. So in a company, if you have a strong leadership, you can try to control the independent decision, but you get a lot of pushback because in making independent decisions is something that people want to keep. You know? So it's not so easy. But when they do this, they add new feedback loops. When I show the big feedback loops of the advertisement system, I show those that are intrinsic to the system, but there are plenty of feedback loops that come from the design of the system and things that people have added on top of each other. And uh, all these methods, they work if I know the feedback loops. If there are feedback loops I'm not aware of, it's not going to be fun. So that means that if you want to do these kind of things, we need a very strong discipline about not only how we produce bits of knowledge from big data, but how we use it. And uh, in the case of uh, uh, something like a nut placement, this is very integrated, so it's very strong. In the case of something like medical data, I don't know. I know that if you write a dynamical system, even a small feedback can change it completely. So in principle, we're not very safe there. In practice, it might be possible to bound the effect. But anyway, that was an, an enriching experience for me because it got me to learn about causation. I, to, I realized that I had to learn about causation and I had to swallow it, so okay. And, uh, it got me to actually make the life of people a little bit less miserable by giving them tools. But that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we have time for one question. Oh, well, it was very clear, it seems. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um,